Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for uh, taking time to join us today. Um, as uh, she mentioned, I'm John from SIBO. Uh, I'm the global head of cryptocurrencies at the exchange. Um, I want to take a few moments and just let my panelists kind of quickly introduce themselves, and then uh, we'll jump right into it. Great. Hi, I'm Colleen Sullivan, CEO of CMT Digital, uh, which is a subsidiary of the CMT Group, a 21-year-old trading and investments firm headquartered in Chicago. Hi, Ariana Simpson. I run a fund called Autonomous Partners, which invests in cryptocurrencies and digital assets, as well as blockchain-based companies. Hi, Tor David from Israel. Uh, I'm from Zuzbit. Uh, basically, what we are doing over there is building a full financial ecosystem, all the services, needs, and uh, uh, technology related uh, to the next uh, step in the crypto market. Great. Thank you very much. So um, I want to kind of get started here and just kind of give everybody a, a, a let everybody here on stage kind of give their uh, moment of like what what got them into crypto. Kind of give a little little quick background and then we'll we'll jump into the questions. So, Colleen, maybe if you start out for us, um, you know, what got hook, got you hooked on crypto? Like, what what was your aha moment? And then kind of the others uh, after Colleen's done. Sure. So I started reading about Bitcoin in 2012. Um, and as I kind of went deeper into it, it kind of occurred to me that this could be the most significant democratization of money ever. Um, not necessarily so important for us in the United States where we tend to take money and banking for granted, but um, in other areas of the world, hugely important. Um, so I started to get involved. I'm a securities attorney by background, so I got involved on the legal side. And then um, in 2013, I spoke with the founders of CMT about allocating a portion of the firm's assets to Bitcoin. Um, I took a trip around Southern Africa in uh, the summer of 2013, and I spent some time in a number of countries, including Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwe had, uh, a few years prior, the second worst uh, hyperinflation in the history of money. And so when I was there, I really saw kind of the economic devastation that they'd gone through and the fact that they'd had to switch over to the US dollar to restabilize the economy. Um, and so when I came back to the United States, I was thinking a lot about monetary policy and what might be possible in a world uh, in which a corrupt central government wasn't controlling all of the monetary supply. And a friend of mine who now runs a company called Blockstack but this was prior to Blockstack, was like, oh, I've recently become obsessed with this uh, Bitcoin thing. And I was like, oh, what's that? And so I read the white paper, and I had this kind of momentous aha moment, as, as a lot of people had, um, just reading the white paper and realizing the implications, as Colleen said, of kind of democratizing um, access to money and financial services. So uh, basically, I'm coming from the HFT industry for the last 12 years. So we're really familiar with everything related to financials and uh, and new technology, uh, infrastructure trading, and so on. So the revolution of the crypto industry and everything related to the Bitcoin when, when it started and all the other coins after it uh, was something that really changed all the atmosphere uh, in the financial ecosystem. And uh, we started, uh, I started, uh, to have a look on the industry, to have a look on the technology, all the big changes that just started uh, a few years ago. And from back then, it's a, it's a long story. <laughs> Thank you, appreciate it. All right, so let's, let's kind of get into it here a little bit. And, and, and as you'll see, and as you've heard, you know, we tried to bring in a, a pretty diverse crowd here on stage to kind of give you an idea, because obviously one of the things we want to focus on is really the, the trading aspects. Of, of what's going on with crypto from, you know, from a, from a uh, physical exchange perspective to the OTC world and then also on the listed derivative space at places like SIBO. So, you know, everybody knows how volatile crypto's been, right? It's not the, it's not the typical 1% swings, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, typically much more than that. And, and obviously, you know, there's a lot of traders that can, can thrive in these environments. Um, you know, how how attractive is is the volatility? Obviously, is this is this something? Is this kind of what what drove you guys into wanting to get into this? Um, obviously, I know Ariana a little different on your side. It was, you know, kind of something on the the monetary side. But obviously, from the trading perspective, you know, what was this that got you to do it? And is it you know, uh, are we going to continue to see this grow? And I guess the the other part is. Is, is your interest more on the, uh, the physical exchange, the OTC, or on the regulated exchange side? 
Um, so let's see. So on volatility, um, you know, we invested in Bitcoin early, and it wasn't the volatility that kind of made us decide to take that long core investment. But on the trading side, definitely, in our traditional markets, we saw such a lull in volatility. And then you looked over at the crypto side, and there's just tremendous volatility. So for proprietary trading firms like CMT, that's very attractive. Um, I think, though, for institutions, that may not be so attractive. And I think um, you know, we'll need some dampening and volatility going forward. You know, you think about um, an institution allocating assets to the space, and if they did that, you know, they thought they were allocating a small portion of their portfolio to the space maybe early 2017. That ended up being a very significant portion of assets, you know, later in 2017, and then it self-corrected in 2018. But I don't think that um, typical institutional investors are used to that kind of volatility. Um, you know, I, I take less of a trading lens and more of a long-term investment um, approach. And so for me, the volatility is necessary because, you know, I think the cycles are really important for attracting interest and talent and resources to the space. Um, so, you know, I think they're kind of a, a necessary part of the process. And it's something that you see across kind of all major technology cycles um, or major technology developments. You see these cycles happen. But um, from an investment perspective, the volatility is more something that I tolerate than something that I try to capitalize on. And to be honest, I think if you look over the past few years, um, you could have pretty extraordinary returns without having traded. And I think in, in many ways that actually uh, sure. kind of, yeah, Better. right. I mean, I, I talked to a lot of folks who uh, were like, oh, we're up 80% for the year last year. And I'm like, cool, I'm up 150 eggs and I did nothing. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think you kind of have to, to be mindful of what the alternative was in just taking a long position. And so, um, yeah, that's not something that I capitalize on too much. That's a great point. George? Uh, I totally agree with that. Uh, I think from investment perspective, so uh, if we're discussing about buying and holding Bitcoin or other coins, so uh, for the long term, it's less mean if you have more volatility or not. Uh, from trading perspective, I think that uh, also the, the, big, the big thing that the CBO done with uh, launching the future on the Bitcoin, so uh, we think more and more, um, we think that the financial industry, the regular one, the trading, really coming into this new space. And uh, as the CBO launch, also the CME. And uh, I, I think in the long term, as more liquidity will enter the market, so the volatility will go down much more. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will see us more as a stable market, as we used to see in the regular trading markets. Mm -hmm. Great, great, thank you. So, you know, regards to, to the trading space, um, there's, there's a lot of different strategies, right? It, it, this is a whole new asset class um, for those of them in, in the financial world. And, and it's very exciting, and, and there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of questions, you know, but the, the same token, there's, there's a lot of different strategies of, of how to trade it, right? You know, like I said, you could, you, you could trade the exchange space, the OTC, the, you know, the regulated space. You know, can you share some thoughts on, um, you know, the trading um, from your perspective? And I guess, Ariana, from your perspective, you know, what you look at for new investments? Sure. Um, so for us, I mean, arbitrage, exchange arbitrage was a huge opportunity, um, really November and December of 2017. I don't think we expected it to collapse within 10 weeks, but it did. Um, I think, you know, as other proprietary trading firms saw that everybody rushed in and it just made the markets more efficient. So that arbitrage is pretty much gone. Um, it's non-existent. Um, so what we've shifted into is some correlation, mean reversion, um, and really like trying to build out more signal-based type trading. And what I think is unique about this space from a trading standpoint is you have these public blockchains that you can analyze. Um, so you can take in a tremendous amount of data from the blockchains, analyze the relationships among the wallets, get nodes positioned properly to where you can see movements out of the wallets before they hit the exchanges and build trading signals off of that. Because trying to build signals off of the order books and what we see on the exchanges is mostly noise because they're unregulated. So it's hard to get good signals off of 
exchanges, not regulated exchanges, unregulated exchanges, where you've got manipulation, wash trading, and all of that. So analyzing the blockchains has been a better uh, avenue for us for building out signals. Great. Yeah, um, so from my point of view, I think in many ways it's not dissimilar to a traditional VC analysis in the sense that obviously I'm thinking about what is the market and what is the team and everything else is kind of secondary to those two considerations. Um, I think one thing that's different about uh, crypto in particular is the fact that the community, I think, plays a much bigger role in, um, you know, what makes an attractive investment versus not. So, you know, I think one of the things that uh, really drove Ethereum's kind of crazy run last year was the community of developers and the confidence that, uh, you know, Ethereum was able to gain because of that community. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that the best tech always wins. And I think in many cases, actually, what ends up happening is somebody who has a strong go-to-market and has a strong um, you know, developer mindshare um, position is going to actually end up being the winner. Um, and so thinking about those dynamics, I think, is, is a big part of what I do. Yeah, and related to the, I think the, the, there is a, a totally new spectrum of, uh, of uh, research also as Colin said, uh, you, you can't analyze anymore the order book and stuff that we used to do in the past. If, uh, if it's a market made, making a trading theme or other quantitative uh, hedge fund. Uh, so it's really a new spectrum of how to analyze, how to find or where to find the right data for those signals. If it's related to our algorithmic trading uh, that most of the volume coming from them. Uh, but I think we will see more and more uh, big players that are familiar from the financial industry coming into this market, connecting to more exchanges, and uh, also the technology is improving all the time. So probably in the next year or two, uh, we will see the volume will raise a little bit, maybe a, a, a bit more. and. Uh, and uh, more and more firms that related to algorithmic trading, I think uh, they will stable the market by those trading, and it, they will find new new ways to analyze the data and to do good trading. So great. So I, when we had our our, our uh, call uh, to discuss the the panel itself, you know. One of the questions I like talking about when I'm on panels and, and this subject is, is you know, how do you short or how do you hedge? How do you ARP? Colleen hit on it here. And, and it was kind of one of those topics that I'd say we spent more than half of our call on. Uh, so I, I'd be remiss to, to not really kind of get into that. So, you know, how, how do you go about employing or do you worry about, you know, the hedging aspects, right? Because I know each of you are, are heavily involved in, in the physical aspects of, of trading. You know, how do you ensure that, you know, if there's a, if there's a run up, right, like what happened in, in December of last year, if there's a big run up, how, how do you ensure that you're able to capture some of that, um, you know, some of that, that those profits? You know, do you, do you employ a shorting as, uh, uh, into your strategies? And if so, how do you, how do you go about doing it? Yeah, so we need SIBO to list crypto options. Let's just start there, and then we'll be in really good shape because we can collar this stuff, sell calls. No comment. Um, but no, I, I mean, it's tricky right now because the, the best place for us to short is um, on unregulated uh, derivatives exchanges because that's where you have the majority of the liquidity and the volume. Um, and that is primarily how we short. Um, we can also borrow coin, but those facilities are not very mature right now, and the terms can be tricky. Um, and at, from a trading standpoint, you need assurance um, on how long you have that coin available, and you can't just have it kind of ripped away. So it, it's a tricky environment right now for shorting, but um, yeah, that's how we do it. Great. So I'm not shorting anything at the moment. Um, I think there is a lot of risk in doing so. Um, interestingly, one of my LPs, uh, Vision Hill Advisors, is a crypto fund of funds, and they put out kind of a benchmarking study, um, and they're trying to start to have metrics to look at what strategies work and what environments and things like that. And one thing that I thought was very interesting, by the way, this report is public. You can look it up if you're interested. But one thing that was um, fascinating was the fact that in 2018, which is like 
a very severe bear market. So you would think that a long short fund would be probably doing better than a long only fund strategy. Um, the long funds actually were doing better than the long short funds on average, which I thought to be very interesting and kind of surprising. And I think part of that is exactly what Colleen mentioned, the kind of issue of what are terms. And I think the availability of, of certain assets and the cost to borrow is extremely high. And so if you end up, you might actually be correct about the asset declining in price, but once you factor in the cost that you have in order to, to take that short position, you might end up actually at a net loss. So, um, you know, I, I think that side of things is still very immature. And the interesting thing is that for me, um, one of the reasons why I don't short anything at this point in time is just because, you know, so many of these assets are still controlled by a very small number of people and or entities. And so you can be 99% right about something and still have a position move incredibly far against you in like a 24 hour period. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that just adds a layer of complexity and risk that's really hard to, to manage for because many of the assets, particularly the ones with smaller market caps, which are also typically more expensive to, to borrow for and to um, you know, find availability for, end up being very easy to manipulate. And therefore, you know, even if you're right about the underlying fundamentals, you could still end up losing quite a bit of money on a given position. So um, yeah, I'm not, not shorting anything yet. Yet. So from- Yeah, uh, we'll see. <laughs> Just waiting for the options, John. <laughs> so from- underlying and risk management perspective, I think uh, the only place really that you can do short, real short uh, is right now on the SIBO and probably also in the CME. So those two trading arenas are the only one right now in, in the market. All the other uh, platforms and are not so uh, well known and not so uh, progressive right now uh, in related to stuff that we're really familiar from trading from the big exchanges. So uh, I think right now, also it's a bit problem to do, to do that. Uh, from a hedging perspective, uh, I think from the moment that you launch the, the future, uh, so there isn't so many uh, institutions today in the market so I think it will be in, in the next following months when, when new money will come in from institutions. But r right now, uh, I don't see too, too many reasons of uh, doing short or hedging this kind of positions. Uh, as you said, it's a very high cost and uh, it's also very difficult. And I think in the CBO right now, we, we can only find a Bitcoin already. So. And I just wanted to add a couple of really good points were just made here um, because, you know, hedging on SIBO, you're hedging on a regulated market where you know what's going to happen. I mean, you know that there's market surveillance, you know that there's not manipulation, you know there's not wash trading, you know. Hedging in these unregulated markets is not for the faint of heart. Um, the point about, um, you know, people being able to come in and just kind of take you out uh, because there's such massive concentration is a very good one and we've seen that happen. And not only that, when you need to get in or out of a position, the tech will go down and then you can't get in to take that position off. Um, also, there's this concept of socialized losses, which I mean would make John's head mind pop blowing. Off. I'm like, <laughs> how is this believable? Where I mean, and and, it, and it's a thing. It, it's absolutely incredible. Um, so it's 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 really dangerous. Oh, sure, yeah. So um, who knows what a socialized loss is? Yeah, okay, yeah, no, so let me explain. Um, so there was recently a very significant trade that went down on um, one of these unregulated swaps exchanges. It was a 400 million notional um, Bitcoin trade. And the exchange, so this particular exchange, you can uh, leverage 100 to one. And um, this trader built up this massive position and you know didn't collateralize it properly, but it was within the exchange rules. And um, someone came in on the other side. There was probably some manipulation going on. Um, the, the position got blown out. And then the exchange is left trying to liquidate the position. But because the markets are so kind of thinly traded, 
the, 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 the price is just going down as the exchange is selling into this like downward stream. So the exchange is accruing losses. And instead of the exchange eating those losses, it goes to the traders that have been profitable on that trade, and it claws back part of the profits, thereby socializing losses. I mean, it's a concept that would never happen in our regulated markets, right? Uh, yeah, that's something I don't think could fly in our, in our world. Yeah. So, uh, I think also from uh, all the risk management and all the risk systems and, uh, and uh, platforms that there are in the regulated exchange uh, doesn't exist at all on the other exchanges. So right, and, and then you get into, you don't know if the exchange itself is trading against you. I mean, there's all, kind, it's just because there's no surveillance, so you, you just don't know what you're dealing with, um, which is why we haven't seen a lot of the big institutions go into these marketplaces. They're fine trading on SIBO and CME, yep. but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's you, you make you make great points. It's it's something where I think you know what what's different here between um, of the other asset classes and and the crypto world is the fact that and I like to use the example that usually when a new asset class comes out, it's the it's the uh, institutional fund players that that come out and then the retail comes in, call it ten years later, yeah. right? This one th this asset class has been has been completely. And the grand stage here is, is, is in some way kind of implied this, you know, with the institutional piece and when the institution's coming. And, and, and believe me, I, I think we, we each talk to these institutions to, to some, ex, some extent. You know, my, my role at the exchange, aside from being the faces, is to really, you know, kind of have my ear to the ground and understand where these, uh, these institutions are coming from. And, and it seems like, you know they they're trying to get in, but I think Colin, you make a you make a great point, right? There's there's just so much instability and, and, and unknown that it's it's very difficult, um, you know, for them to to get into it. And and maybe it's going to take more of that uh, business from the unregulated to the regulated mm -hmm. to happen, or maybe it's going to take uh, the regulators themselves doing something. Right? I don't know what. What do you, what's your take on that? Is it what's it going to take to get these institutional players involved? Because let's be honest, when the institutions get in, they've they they've got the money, right? They've got the flow. They can make things happen. What do you think it's going to take? Yeah. So I think there's two things. I think um, legal certainty and uh, more build out of prime services. So I think legal certainty. You just look at the United States alone and. Um, Bitcoin uh, in 2013 was deemed a currency by FinCEN. In 2014, the IRS said it was property. 2015, the CFTC said it was a commodity. And in 2017, the SEC informally said it's probably not a security. So I, I mean, I, you know, and then we've got the 50 states, right, where you invoke all the money transmission um, issues. So, you know, you're a financial institution looking into this space, and you don't even know what this asset is. So how do you, how do you even move up the chain with that? Um, the problem with regulatory uncertainty is also it equals regulatory arbitrage. All of us travel and um, a lot, and I know my observation is that um, Unlike other industries, there's nothing that really physically tethers a company to the United States. So why not move to Switzerland or Singapore where there's regulatory clarity on some of these issues? And that's what people are doing. Um, so my fear is that the United States will not participate in this asset class like it did in the internet, which means that from an economic standpoint and security setting standpoint, that's going to happen offshore. So it's not like, you know, when that's going to happen. It is happening now. So we need to mitigate that, but we need to be careful in how we go about regulating this uh, area because, I mean, this is open source technology that's open to 7 billion people, right? What's happening today? We have no idea what this is going to look like tomorrow. So we really need some form of principles-based regulation that does not stifle innovation but protects consumers and protects the marketplace. So that's the first piece. The second piece is um, we need the build out of prime services. And I always think it's ironic that I'm saying that for a decentralized asset class that we need more centralized infrastructure. But um, for regulated financial institutions to come in, you need more mature custody solutions. You need prime brokers. You need some type of mature borrowed lending facilities. And you need better trading tools. That said, I think it would be a mistake to pull 
all of that over from the traditional markets into these markets because we can use this technology itself to make all of those prime services better. So we can use blockchain technology and other technologies um, combined with that to have more transparency and more fair marketplace. Um, so I think those are, in my opinion, those are the couple oh, things we great. need. Ariana? Um, I think Colleen did a great job and covered most of it. Um, but yeah, I, I would say, you know, it's starting to happen. And I think some institutions, you know, the news came out recently about um, Yale and Harvard and Stanford endowments starting to invest in a couple of, you know, very blue chip crypto funds like Andreessen Horowitz and, and Paradigm. Um, but I think what that opens is kind of, it really allows for air cover for institutional investors from the endowment side, for example, who may have been interested in the asset class, but were not necessarily going to be first movers to start seriously looking at the space. In most cases, it's going to be initially kind of one layer removed. So they're investing via managers who are focused on the space more so than directly. Um, but you know, I think in the next six months or so, we're going to start to see kind of a wave of this money starting to enter. So I think it, it is happening, obviously, with uh, the caveats that Colleen mentioned. Yeah, so uh, you really covered all the regulation uh, part. So I will move to the services, technologies, some uh, serious platform from trading, execution, custodian, all back office, all the stuff that the banks and, and other exchanges, prime brokers are using today. Uh, I'm a bit right because this is exactly what we are doing at uh, Zuzbit. So building all this uh, infrastructure and, uh, and products. Uh, but I really think that the institutions when they will have this technology, they have this product, they have the platform, they will start to enter the market. And I think that uh, we're going to see it very soon. You, you know, you bring up an interesting point, Dror. Um, obviously, we, we hit on the regulatory aspects. That's, that's a, major, uh, a major piece for, for, for any institution um, wanting to get into the space. But you talked about custody, right? Custody, I, personally, I think it's, it's, it's one of the other big issues that's, that's sitting out there. And, you know, you, you think of uh, like a State Street or a Northern Trust as, as these huge um, you know, custodial players. What's it going to take? Because obviously we're going to need that, those, those, those types of players or others to come about and then to get, you know, bought by one of the big players to, to really get this thing moving. What's it going to take? I mean, for the for the custody aspects. I don't know if you have an opinion on this. Yeah, um, and and I look at it from the trading standpoint. So in the traditional markets, we're happy to give custody of our assets to our prime broker because we get financing and margin in return, right? So for us, we're very happy with the self custody solution we have right now because there's not a custodian out there that can move assets in and out of the trading environment as rapidly as we need. On top of that, even if there were, I'm not sure the benefit to us, I mean, I see there's benefits, right, but, but to give custody of our assets to a custodian and not receive kind of margin or financing in return just from a trading standpoint doesn't make a ton of sense for us. Generally, though, I mean, you're absolutely right. We have to have more mature custodians out there. And just from a regulatory standpoint, I won't bore people, but if you're an SEC registered investment advisor, you have to have custody of all customer funds and securities with a qualified custodian, um, which is a, a, a regulatory defined term. So we've got, I think, like 2,040 crypto assets right now. We only have regulatory assurance informally that two of them are not securities. So for all those other assets, um, the conservative approach would be that if you're an RIA, you need to hold them with a qualified custodian. But we'll get there. I mean, and I think the big guys are all working on it. And, the, you know, it, it's coming. And, and the security aspects. I mean, that obviously comes along with oh, the custodial yeah. pieces. I mean, you have a lot of these, these exchanges, uh, physical exchanges, that are obviously creating their own custodial platforms. So and I don't know if uh, I draw. I know you have a companion, but Ariana. I mean, yeah, lovely. I work with a couple uh, different custodians. Um, you know, for me, it's a bit easier because speed of moving assets in and out is not really an issue because I take you know a multi multi year view, so I can kind of park it and secure it. And I'm really more concerned with like not having any security breaches than I am about being able to move in and out quickly. Um, so I think my use case is more solved for than Colleen's. But even still, I mean, it's, you know, we're still in this phase where 
out of the top 20 assets, you literally cannot find a custodian for like a significant number of them, which is bananas considering where we are, you know, in, ten, in time. So um, I think that in the next like six months, we're gonna start to see most of at least the top 50 assets taken care of. Um, you know, I'm obviously in conversations with, with uh, a number of folks who are working on this, um, but right now it's, it's not quite a solved problem. Um, but, you know, again, I think that's really just a matter of time. I think uh, the custody spectrum is going to change completely because of the different asset and how they build. Uh, today, when you're going, you need a custody or you're going to a prime broker or bank or whatever, just put the money over there, you get a credit line, for whatever, margin, whatever. Um, here with, with crypto coins and cryptocurrencies, uh, it's a bit different because it's on the blockchain, it's on the net. It's a bit, a bit of a problem to, to take it physically, as we are uh, already doing today with the, with the real money. So I think we will see uh, improvement and a big change in this direction in the next few years. Uh, it will start, as you said, in the, in the next following months. Uh, but uh, it will be a, a long uh, process uh, until it will be uh, will become mainstream, and okay. you know, great. So you know the, the the regulatory aspects, the custodial aspects, they they obviously all uh, kind of figure into you know what I think we're going to see changes in in the future. You know the the big thing I think that it's it's a lot of big question mark in, in a lot of people's minds nowadays is you know you've got these you've got a lot of unregulated. Uh, entities and exchanges um, popping up, and you know, my I guess my question I pose this to to each of you is, you know, will, will we see regulators and I'll, I'll just say U.S. regulators to kind of uh, uh, kind of level this out is will we see the U.S. regulators kind of make these unregulated exchanges move towards becoming more regulated, or will we see more of a an FX type market where it's kind of a I'll say Wild West. Yeah, so it, it's tricky right now um, in the United States because we have this gap in regulation where the CFTC only has jurisdiction over derivatives on commodities and not the spot commodity uh, market itself, except with respect to fraud and manipulation, whereas the SEC has jurisdiction over securities and derivatives on securities. So because Bitcoin was deemed a spot commodity, it kind of fell within that regulatory gap. And that's why you see many exchanges in the United States they're not registered with the CFTC or the SEC like SIBO is. Instead, they've got their money transmitter licensing and they're registered with FinCEN. Um, I, right, if that. No, that you're exactly right, if that. There's a lot that, that don't comply with that. Um, my sense from Washington is that the regulators are not necessarily, the CFTC is not necessarily interested in coming in and taking uh, jurisdiction over the spot market. They're used to dealing with a different investor base, not retail like the SEC. Um, so I think it's kind of incumbent on the industry to self-regulate, and we're starting to see that. Um, the Gemini Exchange kind of put out there the Virtual Commodity Association, that's an industry-led SRO. Um, so hopefully that will get some traction. Um, we'll see. With respect to the exchanges offshore that are unregulated, that have U.S. people trading on them, um, what we've seen uh, is that those exchanges have taken steps to kick all U.S. people off their platforms. I'm guessing that's because there was some U.S. regulatory scrutiny um, about what was going on there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah. Yeah, I'm seeing an increasing number of companies doing something like getting registered in Malta and then um, working on kind of in parallel getting all the necessary, you know, ATS licensing, securities exchange, et cetera, et cetera, in the United States, but initially not being open to U.S. customers. And, you know, to Colleen's earlier point about this being, I think, a real um, threat to the United States actually kind of falling behind if we don't kind of get our act together on the regulatory front, I think that's very real because at the end of the day, um, 
technology companies will move to wherever they need to go in order to run their business. And particularly because so much of the crypto trading activity is actually coming out of other places like Asia. Uh, it's like, well, who cares about the US? Because if we can make more money off Asian traders who tend to be more active in other markets as well, then you know it, it becomes really interesting to, to be based, you know, maybe it's Malta, maybe it's Singapore, but in somewhere that is not as uh, regulatorily onerous as the United States. Yeah, I am. Uh, I mean, just Ariana made a really um, good point. I just kind of wanted to, um, from a trading standpoint, she's absolutely right. Like, and this is one of the challenges I think we have with the U.S. regulated exchanges. As a trading firm, you really do want to interact with that kind of order flow that we see on the Asian exchanges. Um, and just to be blunt, it's not KYC; it's retail. Um, and that's a challenge. It's a challenge for a regulated exchange like SIBO to attract that order flow over to SIBO. Um, so yeah, I just... I totally agree with you, both of you. I really think that from... Uh, we are in the state right now, but I think uh, most of the time, the uh, U US is uh, setting the rules and everybody's following. Uh, on this particular... Uh, subject, what we are seeing is that you can find, you know, in Switzerland, you can already pay tax in Bitcoin. Uh, you have different authorities in different spaces, in, if it's Europe or uh, in, in the east part, uh, Asia, uh, that we can see different uh, regulation and different uh, progress on this subject. And really, the, the U.S. is really behind that. Uh, and I think this is the reason why all the companies and technology are going over there. Um, and I think it's a shame because the, the US, most of the time taking the lead, setting up a really good regulation uh, that stabilize the market and uh, keeping and uh, taking care of for all the sides in the, in the, in the game. So. Uh, we hope to see something in the, in the States very soon related to regulation. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen very soon. So. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't want to stay on the regulatory piece uh, that long. But I do want to go back to, oh, uh, yeah, hello. I know we all love talking about this. <laughs> um, but I do want to kind of get back to, and, and, and obviously, you know, SIBO is traditionally an, an options exchange. And obviously, Colleen's worked with our exchange long enough that she knows uh, the history. So I, I, I'm not going to comment about the, the options piece in terms of uh, us doing it anytime soon. But, you know, there's, there is options trading. There's, there's Ether futures trading on, on some of these unregulated exchanges. And, and it's, it's no secret that, that Cebo's working on a, an Ether futures regulated contract. You know, as, as exchanges like mine continue to, you know, push out further, right? A perfect example, I tell everybody, you know, I'm, I'm head of the crypto department, not head of Bitcoin. We're, you know, going to eventually have a number of futures contracts on a number of coins. Do you, how do you think that's going to continue to interact with the unregulated world? Is that, is that something where you're going to see more flow in general? Or, or is it going to continue to be more dominated by the unregulated space? Yeah, so I mean, I think you actually touched on it when you said that this has sort of been flipped, right? Where we have retail leading all the growth and not institutional. So I think that for the regulated exchanges, in the near term, it's going to be important to try to attract some of that retail flow over. Um, and we just need volumes to increase, right? I mean, right now, the global crypto asset marketplace is, I think this morning was 218 billion. That's one fifth the size of one US technology company, Apple, right? I mean, it's very small. So we just generally need more volumes, um, which will come. Yeah, I um, yeah, I, I honestly don't have much to add beyond what Colleen. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so uh, it's really connected to my previous answer. Um, I think that we will see more uh, exchanges coming from offshore uh, of the state uh, because, you know, we're good friends, but you see how much time it's taken to the CBO to add additional currencies and uh, make more futures or different structures. So 
and it's again, it's the regulation and all this stuff that putting it behind instead of uh, pushing it forward, so. Yeah, and I would say the, the regulated exchanges, it's the right call in the long term, right? Like, I, I have no doubt that that on, as far as like where regulated institutions and you know, retail flow will eventually end up. And I don't know if it's unregulated exchanges that end up becoming regulated, you know, or if it's the regulated exchanges that kind of end up taking the flow. But um, I think that long term, that's the right play. Because we view these, un I mean, the kind of um, dynamic risk analysis we're doing in trading on unregulated exchanges and how much coin and fiat we're comfortable, if they even allow fiat, how much we're comfortable leaving on exchange at any one time and just, the, the just adjusting constantly. I mean, because these exchanges, SIBO obviously um, is broken into different pieces. The, in the unregulated exchange world, the exchange itself is the exchange, the broker, the custodian, the clearing firm, and sometimes the liquidity provider. That's unheard of in the regulated world. And I do think even unregulated exchanges are starting to understand that you have to break some of those pieces apart in order to make it just a more stable environment, period. Yeah, you, you bring up a great point. I mean, this is this is something that I think is is going to take. Um, it's going to it's going to need time. to happen. Uh, it's, it it's, take a long time. Yeah, it's, you're right. It's going to take a long time. But I think, like you said, it's it's the long term, right? It's it's one of those factors that, you know, perfect example is this this energy trader uh, that was trading up in the Nordics, who was self clearing, right? How how does something like that happen in a regulated market? And and that's just a perfect example of. You know, if something moves the wrong way and someone's self-clearing themselves, there's, 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 you know, a precedent to, you know, something bad happening there, right? It's, I think we're all in belief that, you know, this is a great asset class for the long term, but if you keep believing too much power in, in one person's hands, then you're going to have something like that eventually happen, which is why I think the traditional markets have obviously kind of have split that up. So, um, one last topic I just want to kind of touch on is is um, you know, pricing um, in, in terms of trading, whether it be on the physical exchanges or, or the regulated exchanges. And I think you know, everybody could kind of agree that over the long term, uh, over the past few years, we've seen that the, the, the cost to trade on traditional exchanges has, has begun to decline. Um, but it's, it's still kind of funny because you know, I tell people that if you want to trade a Bitcoin future, the most, most you're going to pay is 100 bips. And I talk to these crypto exchanges, and they're like, oh, that's nothing, right? What's it going to take to get you know, that pricing down to, to earth, right? I mean, is, is it going to be time? Is it going to be, you know, what, what do you think? I mean, we're starting to see some of it come down a little bit just because volumes have collapsed so much. So I think with volumes collapsing, more competition, um, and more unique structures with some of these exchanges where they're using their own coins and different things like that to attract flow, um, I think the pricing will come down. I also keep waiting for when the crypto exchanges realize they can monetize their market data. Because um, our traditional Shh, exchanges, I know, I mean, they, they make more off of market data than they do trading fees. Not SIBO. Yeah, <laughs> bets. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I think prices are across the board going to come down. I mean, obviously on the trading side, more competition certainly helps with that. But even in, in other areas like custody and things like that, you know, like 100 basis points or, you know, whatever is like completely out of the universe of the acceptable in like other asset classes. I mean, p people like literally laugh like, is that a joke? And so, um, you know, I, I think that's already starting to get compressed. And I think obviously the same is, is starting to happen on the trading side. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my point of view is, you know, because I do most of my trading actually with OTC desks, it's a slightly different model um, in the sense that, you know, you're, you're paying fees, but in a slightly different way. And so for me, it's, it's honestly more about like knowing what I'm gonna pay, like what is actually going to be the price at which my order executes rather than, um, you know, I, I would rather pay a slightly higher price but know what I'm paying rather than, you know, kind of have it be all over the place because you do see uh, really bad slippage in a lot of cases if you're not doing that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think all of these things are kind of growing pains of, of a new industry, but nothing that won't be resolved in a couple years. Yeah, I think there, there is uh, a correlation between the volumes and the volatility and everything related to the, to the cost 
of, uh, of what you are paying today for to doing a trade. And uh, as the volume will raise up, the volatility will go down. And I think also the pricing of the, of the trading will go down also. And I should just add, Ariana made a great point. We haven't even really touched on it, although you've brought it up a couple times. Um, the OTC marketplace in crypto is huge. Um, it's our understanding that between 70 and 80% of the volume takes place on an OTC basis. So while we've all been focused on talking about exchanges, that's actually not where most of the volume is happening. That will change as the regulatory environment gets cleared up, as we have more certainty with some of these unregulated exchanges. But I think it's important. To know. Yeah, no, you're and, right. Oh, sorry, sorry, I would just add that uh, a big part of that for me is also risk management. And, you know, again, the point of socialized losses, counterparty risk, like is the exchange going to get hacked? Is the exchange going to run off with my money? Is somebody going to screw up their $400 million trade and I'm going to take a haircut? Like all of these things are issues that you don't really have to deal with on the OTC side. Um, you know, there are many of the same sort of regulatory considerations and questions that are still open um, for OTC desks, but I do think that it, it is a way of trading that mitigates at least some of the uh, risk factors. And so if you're less concerned maybe about moving in and out of, of positions really quickly, then it can be a, you know, a more attractive solution. Great, great. Um, We've, we've come to an end. Unfortunately, we don't have time for q and A. I I think uh, all of us will be outside for, for a few minutes if you want to chat with us. But I really want to thank uh, Ariane, obviously, being from Chicago, Colleen flying, or from San Francisco, uh, Colleen flying in from Chicago, and then Doror flying all the way from Tel Aviv, just for this, of course, right? You're not doing anything <laughs> yeah, yeah. else. Nothing You're right. else. So I want to thank everybody for, uh, for attending, and uh, hopefully you, uh, you know, learned something here. Thank you.